Hello, guys. Um, bear with if, the, if I'm not talking appropriately, just start going like this with the microphone. Um, so I'm Nikki. I'm from PwC, um, and I'm going to talk to you today about a concept that we've been working on for a little while. Obviously, um, this concept has seen a lot of heat in the last couple of months. Probably not the right word. Didn't mean that. But <laughs> um, and it's kind of what we're seeing as a country is that we're coming to a point of climax. Um, and coming to a point of anger and frustration and, and a lot of this imagery behind me we're all acutely aware of, um, particularly over the last few months and moving into 2020. I will loop back here um, and we will end up where we are today, but I want to step back a bit and take you on a journey of some of the undercurrent themes and trends um, that need to be considered in terms of how we got here and how we can move forward. So today I'm going to be posing the question, is Australia facing social revolution too? Disruption and turbulence always happens in cycles. Um, so to talk about what I mean by social revolution two, uh, I'm just going to touch on Australia's social revolution one. So the 60s, but culminating in the 70s, was a period of social, cultural, institutional um, change in Australia and we were radically redefined. There was hardly a conventional, a convention, Australian, an Australian way of life or an institution that wasn't either seriously challenged or radically changed out of the 70s. It was a decade of protests. Um, protests around themes of feminism, gay rights, immigration, uh, multiculturalism, and all protests that really demanded equality and recognition. It was a time when ordinary private voices were heard publicly for the first time, and as a result, social ground shifted. It was a time when the Australian home was opened up and exposed. We had a royal commission into human relationships, and through that, the home was always considered a safe haven. There was the traditional nuclear family, but that really exposed the reality of Australian households, and it was the first time domestic violence became a thing in our country, uh, and it really inspired women's liberation. It was actually probably the first Me Too movement, um, looking back. So ultimately, through this upheaval, the personal became political and the polit politicians had to respond. We saw the Whitlam government end 23 years of coalition rule and a huge amount of uh, political, social, legal um, and institutional change. So we in they introduced free university, which particularly affected and benefited women. The Family Law Act meant that you could get divorced at no fault. There was equal pay, which led women in droves into the workforce for the first time. The supporting mother's benefit obviously accompanied that. We scrapped the White Australia policy. We introduced the Racial Discrimination Act. Um, land rights movement gave Indigenous people land titles for the first time ever. There was a Department of Aboriginal Affairs. We scrapped um, conscription. We ended the death penalty. We introduced universal public um, health care. Uh, that we introduced a centre for the arts and culture and creativity, which I think has just been abolished in a lot of its senses. Um, so there's huge amounts of change. And what this did was it really changed the norms and the cohesion, it changed structure of um, family dynamics, it changed everything down to consumption and media patterns. So work became the pioneering asp um, aspiration for women and this redefined the workforce forever. Divorce rates increased, mostly instigated by women who now could divorce, um, and this led to shrinking households. By the 90s in Australia, 50% of households only had one or two occupants in them, which was unheard of before that. What this did was change media and consumption habits to accommodate the smaller households. So radio became the most popular medium for companionship, uh, and things like the VCR, dishwasher and microwave were introduced, which all liberated individual behaviour. This was when we first saw the breakdown in um, traditional nuclear family, meal times. Uh, we saw the rise in pre-prepared meals, um, home delivery, and all these things around convenience and kind of fending for yourself. Ultimately though, through darkness, turmoil, and revolution, we reform. And this was also critical because it was the first time we really consciously investigated what it meant to be Australian on a global stage. We valued things like our currency, our flag, we changed our national anthem, which was God Save the Queen before here. Um, and we formed the OCA, we formed the archetype of who, Australian, what, who Australia was. And we, put, we heard our voices on TV screens and we saw ourselves in movies and global movies. 
We Aussie rock became a staple in pubs and radios and Aussie rock is unique. It's always been unique. It sings about our country and our themes and our way of life. And so ultimately there was this real pride in what Australia was and what it took to be Australian. Um, and that was there was a kind of a unity after all of this, a, a, a commonality and a common ideology of, of who it was and what it meant to be Australian. So today. So 2019 was kind of declared the year of revolt, but actually the 2010s as a decade was a, a pretty much a collective no to the system. It's been a period of protest, and the protests are very similar in the theatrical activism of the 60s and 70s, but the undercurrents of protest is the same as well. So it's a time of um, demanding equality and recognition. We're seeing the same things come up, feminism, gay rights, immigration, indigenous rights, multiculturalism. And ultimately, we're seeing us, us challenge our conventions, challenge what it means to be Australian again, challenge our way of life. But also, it's a revolution or it's a protest at the moment that's being instigated again by young people. Now, young people of any era are going to um, kind of dispute the establishment to some degree, but the demographic, political and social imbalances that this generation is feeling has really made that acute. And what's interesting is that there's actually a manifested in a different tone. So the revolution of the 70s was f excitement and possibility. Yes, there was activa act activism and protest, but they, n they felt like they could transform the world. Today is filled with anger, fear and resentment. It's a very different tone and it's expressed in a very different way. Ultimately, that's because the kids aren't all right. So generation on generation in Australia, economic progress has become the norm. And it is unprecedented till now that a younger generation of Australians will grow up into adulthood worse off than the ones before it. The significant feature and defining feature of this millennial generation is inequality, and inequality on all fronts. So from wage stagnation to um, rising household debt for young people particularly, obviously housing and, affordably, um, a housing and affordability on top of that, a tax concessions that support the elderly, but a young generation who's going to have to support them into welfare. Unemployment, but critically underemployment for the most educated generation with very expensive uni bills that their parents got for free. And ultimately now we're also seeing a climate crisis and a climate that they are set to repair and live through, um, which may be beyond repair. So what we're calling this is the revolution of resentment. And that's how Social Revolution 2 is, and we'll get to this, is also fundamentally different to one and actually quite scary. So if you look at revolutions, the condition for revolutions are ripest after a very long period of economic and social progress and then a short, sharp period of decline. If you look at the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution, it's always the ones who had the promise of hope that feel it the worst. So these young people aren't revolting because they feel disappointed that they might be poor. Um, they're gutted because of the expectations and lifestyles that, were ex that they can see were experienced by those in, in front of them and are still experienced to some degree at their expense. And it's kind of important to note that broadly um, and globally, the demand for recognition and the politics of resentment is what unifies a lot of world politics today. So the liberal world order doesn't always um, benefit everyone in the way it says it will. Uh, but economic grievances are felt much more acutely when they're coupled with um, disrespect and indignity. So as the 60s and 70s um, came about because there was an um, empowerment around their voices, they could finally have a public voice, they felt empowered and impulsed to revolt. What we're seeing now is an unprecedented fuel source that's actually um, creating a huge amount of disruption underneath what we're seeing. So the digital revolution opened up this tsunami of information um, and social media and the internet has been correlated with uh, increasing levels of social and political unrest. They're more empowered and they're more impulsive and we're revolting and we're saying no to the establishment, no to the status quo, no to the way things are. But what's interesting is if you look at the traditional power structures, you look at the modern form of government, you look at the modern form of institutions, they were all created in an industrial age and therefore they have an industrial form. They're very top-down, they're very hierarchical, and to maintain their power and their control, they need almost a semi-monopoly of information. So until now, and actually this is still being challenged in our country, the government and the media have worked very closely together in terms of achieving that goal. Um, we've seen corporations 
who have broken down the last two years and seen huge amounts of crisis because they can't control information anymore. They don't have the power to disseminate and give information that serves them. And we're seeing the rise of employees, citizens, advocates, and everyone who has a voice who's calling them out. And this is leading to a crisis of, crisis of authority around the establishment. They can't maintain the power in these systems that they used to because the systems are broken. Ultimately, what this is all leading to is tribalism. So we're seeing polarization, populism, um, tribalism, and ultimately what this comes down to and what's fueling it, as we've just talked about, is the internet. Because the internet was supposed to be a marketplace for ideas, but it's becoming a marketplace for identities. And identity politics can, will be the, one of the defining questions of our age. Um, in our age of grievance, our age of outrage, when we're fearful, we're looking for our sense of belonging. It's very easy to retreat into what divides us to define us. But if we don't start to have healthy ideas of identity, we don't find a common narrative, we don't find a common um, vision in terms of what unites us, we'll retreat into battles within each other that will battle ourselves to no end. So what now? So that's kind of a very top line um, and there's a lot underneath this. There's a very top line kind of parallel of where we are today and what's changed and what's fueling it. But critically, we are actually at a different place to the 60s and 70s. We want change, but we're not sure what change looks like and we haven't yet examined or defined what that looks like. So the 60s and 70s, they knew what they were against, but they also knew what they were for. They were fighting for specific changes. They were fighting for actions. They had hope. They had something to aim for. They knew what they wanted to achieve. Today, the global liberal order is under threat and we're seeking a different model of democracy or a different system but we only at the moment have really one modality and that's negation. So everything's just saying no, we're just saying no to everything. And we're at risk of political nihilism when we know exactly what we're against, but we don't know yet what we're for. When this happens, broken politics, we look to business to fulfill. So the evolution of advertising and consumer promises was used to be buy your way to a better version of yourself. Um, today it's buy your way to a better world. Increasingly we're asking businesses and corporations to step up, be more conscious, have a greater role, be more sustainable. This is great and this is necessary, but the marketplace is not a democracy. The way corporations are structured again in their industrial form and our big corporations is not to be conscious. Um, and we need for progress to happen, it always has to have a combination of the market and the state. Um, what we're really at risk of is apathy and particularly apathy with young people. So a third of young people last year wouldn't have voted if it wasn't compulsory. 67% of young Australians don't see the difference between the two parties, are switches and have no political preference. They just don't care. Um, and so it's really critical that these two things come together for us to progress. So ultimately, from identities to ideas. So what we need out of all this is a common ideology. We need to stop saying no. Um, the danger is that no feels like progress because you do feel like you're progressing when you're revolting, but if you keep pushing with no vision, you don't get very far. So what Australians have been fighting for for 10 years and what we've looked at a lot is the um, mythology around our values, our values of mateship, egalitarianism, anti-authoritarianism, all these values that we still hear politicians and the government espouse and, and CEOs espouse don't really have a lot of relevance to young Australians or even modern Australians. They're very masculine, um, they're very white, um, but ultimately they're what we have. And that's because throughout history, nations form long-standing bonds and long-standing identities through wars and through their famines, through civil battles, through unrest. And these are ancient foundations that have defined big com big countries and they can always rely on that. But Australia is young and we've never really had that. We've never had that foundation or that formation that's really defined who we are. So in absence of that, we've used um, other things as proxies. So for example, when we've had roles in um, the global stage, we've used that to define us. Um, Gallipoli is a really good example of this. The government invests a lot every year maintaining the narrative around Gallipoli. Gallipoli was when we became mates, it was when we became battlers, it was when we were the underdog but the heroes and the champions and we still try and keep this narrative going because it's really important to have a common narrative around who we are. But these are redundant now and no one has defined it. 
so what the opportunity is, there's a potential opportunity here, is this climate war is our world war. It's on our turf, it's at a global stage, and it's really a moment in time when we have the opportunity to define ourselves, to unite, to find common ground, and to find a vision around how we progress and how we define who we are through this. It's our foundation um, war, it's our trauma, our tragedy, and unfortunately through tragedy and trauma, that's how we reform and find out who we are. But what's really interesting is that there's opportunities for common ground now that have never happened before, or if they have happened, not to this mass effect that we have. So here are three, obviously very top line, but the acknowledgement of country. So Australia will never be able to define who it is or move forward without reconciling old and new. We've really struggled with this for a long time. And what's happening now is there's starting to be a mass, but it's definitely moving, an appreciation of the indigenous respect for land, the cultivation of land. They know how to live on this country. They know how to survive it. They know how to maintain um, bushfires. They know how to look after it. They know everything. And unfortunately, what's happened is now it's taken till now for us to have a mainstream platform for them to explain how to look after the country we live on. So this is presenting an opportunity to give respect and recognition back, to move forward in terms of how we survive and how we thrive and how we define country. Regional and urban. Regional and urban Australia is very um, polarised and different. They're different attitudinally, demographically, geographically, politically. Um, and there's always been a divide there. Um, regional Australia has always said, we don't care about, urban Australia doesn't care about them. They don't care about the drought. We don't really care about farmers. And a mirror to that is urban Australians still use regional Australia to really define what it is to be Australian. We love SUVs, we love thinking that we go to the bush, we love talking about being tough Australians, but often we don't really connect with what regional Australia is. This fire in this last couple of months has broken that. It's allowed urban people to understand the importance of regional Australia on all fronts, um, from a tourism, from a... Um, economic perspective, but also just a connection perspective. We've, we've kind of galvanised into what the Australian life means, how fundamentally important it is that regional Australia thrives. And we have, for the first time, come together to fight for what that is and are seeing that as a role in defining who we are. Our last opportunity is economic growth reframed. So the narrative around economic growth in our country has consistently been based around taxes um, and obviously resources and um, minerals. This narrative is strong with boomers and it's strong with the base of the government, uh, but it's not strong with youth. It doesn't relate to them at all. They don't understand how, how, what it means for their futures. A lot of the policies and a lot of the economic narratives around that don't actually re relate to them in any way. Um, but economic growth and progress is critical for us as well. So there's an opportunity now to reframe this binary of right and left and reframe the economic narrative into something that we can all get behind. We're re-looking re at what we think of tourism and the value of immigration, the value of education uh, and what we need to invest in from an innovation point of view and how we need to come together and how important our economy is but in a new light that can bind people together. So ultimately, these are just some concepts um, and it's very top line in terms of what we're going through but we're at this real tipping point of change uh, and as you can see, it's always developed from a young people and it's always protest. But if we can bridge that tribalism and that inequality and come together and find common ground, um, it'll be critically important. And now is a time when Australia can define itself and reset what is our national ideology and our common ideology and our values.